Brett McKay here, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. Well, I am really excited about today's episode because I am talking with one of my favorite writers. His name is Stephen Pressfield. I know a lot of you are probably familiar with his work, a prolific writer, both fiction and nonfiction. Uh, he wrote The Legend of Bagger Vance. Uh, Stephen's also, the books that I've been devouring this year are the, uh, the Gates of Fire series. Uh, they're fictional, historical accounts of, you know, the first one, Gates of Fire, is about the Battle of Thermopylae um, with the Spartan 300. He did a book about the uh, the campaigns of Alexander the Great, and the one that I really enjoyed, Tides of War, about the Peloponnesian War. Uh, we're going to talk about that book today. Uh, he's also written a lot of great nonfiction uh, that's popular amongst entrepreneurs, creative types, uh, where he applies this warrior ethos that he writes in his fiction to uh, real life. Uh, so great stuff. We're going to talk about in today's episode why uh, Stephen is drawn to writing about war, why he writes about war, why he's particularly drawn to the ancient Greeks. And uh, we're also going to talk about the warrior ethos and how you can apply it uh, in different aspects of your life, particularly uh, the creative life, when you're trying to do something creative with your life, whether you're starting a business or pursuing a passion like writing. Uh, So great stuff. I think you'll get a lot out of it. Uh, So stay tuned. Just to give you a warning, uh, that we use some big boy language in this episode, so if you are listening to this in your office cubicle, put some headphones on. Uh, if you got kids, you don't want them to hear that sort of thing. Uh, just listen to it later. So it's fair warning. Uh, so let's do this. All right. Well, Stephen Pressfield, welcome to the show. Hey, pleasure to be here, Brett. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm really excited because there's so much I want to talk about in uh, just a short amount of time because you're writing, you're just a prolific writer and you write across genres, nonfiction, fiction, screenplays, um, and I think our readers are really going to enjoy talking or listening to you because that you write a lot about war. Um, that's a kind of a common theme, even in your nonfiction, uh, your fiction, obviously, and even the legend of Bagger Vance, would, I would yeah, say. Yeah, that's actually kind of astute of you to pick that up. Most people would not uh, get that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it sort of has a warrior motif in it. Um, yeah. so my first question is what draws you to war and warriorhood? Well, first of all, I'm not a, I'm not a combat veteran. I was like a reserve Marine many, many moons ago, you know, but I've never been in combat or, you know, anything like that. So I, I, I can't claim that it has anything to do with that. But I think that um, I, I see life as a battle. I see it, you know, uh, my from the minute I wake up in the morning, you know, trying to get my act together. And I see each day as a, as a struggle to to slay the dragons of you know self sabotage and laziness and perfectionism and all the other stuff that that uh, that uh, you know screws us up all the time. And um, and I, and I also find that the the virtues of a writer or the virtues that you need to succeed in the creative arts are to me the virtues of a warrior. Um, the ability, patience. Courage, the ability to endure adversity, uh, sense of humor, respect for the enemy, that kind of thing. So that's, you know, that's my best answer to it. But <laughs> I, I really don't know. I mean, I just was sort of, you know, I, I worked as a writer for, or a struggling writer for probably 25 years before I wrote the first thing that was about war. I don't know why. And then I just sort of wrote another one and another one and another one. So there's a certain mystery to the whole thing. The unanswerable quality to it. Well, um, why? So you have like this whole series um, about the Peloponnesian, you know, the Peloponnesian Wars. What draws you to like classical Greek culture and those wars that happened during that golden age of Greece? Ah, that's a that's a good question, Brett. It's and here's the weird part of it is that although I am drawn to Greece and very fascinated by that, I couldn't give a shit about Rome. <laughs> and right, they're the same thing basically. But I, I don't know why. So maybe it's previous lives or something. But the other, I think that ancient Greece, particularly Athens and Sparta, are just like a fascinating sort of petri dish. They're kind of like our era. But on a much smaller scale, where you where things are clear and you can kind of see it, you know, it, it's not as confusing as it is. And the other thing I, I love about ancient Greece is it's it's like pre-Freudian, 
pre-industrial, particularly pre-Freudian, pre-Christian, pre-Judaic, pre-all the crap that screws things up, you know, pre-communist, pre-fascist, and the, the, the ancient Greeks kind of had what I think is a really clear-eyed view of what human nature is about. I mean, they had a very, I won't say it, it was a dark view, but it wasn't dark to them. They just sort of saw it for the way it was. They knew that when people got pushed to the wall, they did some pretty, you know, bad things. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I just, I love the prose from those days, you know? If you read, uh, I don't know if your readers are into this stuff, but if you read Thucydides, if you read Xenophon, if you read Plato, if you read Plutarch, um, it's just pellucid, clear, great prose that when you're finished reading it, you feel better about yourself instead of worse, like so much of the stuff that's out today. And you just mentioned something that leads me to my, my next question I had. So you talk, you mentioned how the Greeks had this understanding of human nature that I don't think we really have. It's not very, they had a very nuanced understanding of human nature. They had like these, what I, they had these like concepts, right? Like words that described a feeling or a state, um, like for example, thumos, right? Yeah, um, and it, it, it's hard to describe uh, in our vernacular because we don't have like a vocabulary for it. Um, and what I love about your books is that you take these big Greek concepts about human nature, and you make them like the main theme of your book, and you weave that in throughout your novel. So, for example, in the Virtues of War, right about the campaigns of Alexander the Great, that Greek concept or virtue was dynamis. Yeah, yeah. Can you explain dynamis uh, to our listeners? And you know, it's um, you know, I'm not even sure I really understand. It. <laughs> I have kind of an, my own idea. Of what yeah, it is. And I gave it a Greek word. Here's a little. I got to tell you a little confession before sure. I, I do this. I have a friend who's a Greek named uh, Hippocrates Conzios. He's a professor down in Florida. And a lot. What I would do in, in my early books is I'd come up with kind of a a press field concept, yeah. and I'd send it to Hip. And I'd say, what's the Greek word for this? And he would come up with, you know, sometimes he even had to invent a word for it. But so uh, I shouldn't tell you this, but that's that's uh, that's the truth. But dynamis is just, you know, um, it's it's close to eros in the sense of uh, just a drive, the will to win. It's really, you know, the art of manliness. It's that sort of masculine drive. And I don't just mean it in a, in a sexual or gender sense. It's, you know, the old concept of uh, the sky god that shoots a bolt of lightning down to earth and earth is feminine and the sky god is, is masculine. And that's kind of what it is. Um, but let me, before I forget this, Brett, let me uh -huh. say one other thing about why I like the, the Greek mentality. It's like a lot of the, the, the philosophies that we deal with today, and I, I was just mentioning Freudianism, communism, and fascism, and, and Christianity as well, have this idea of if we only do such and such, we will be saved. You know what I mean? It's like if, if, we're, if it's Freudian, it's if I just get analyzed enough and solve the stuff in my head, then I'll be happy, you know? Or Christianity, it's like, if I could just live like Jesus, if I could turn the other cheek, if I could love my fellow man, I would emerge to some higher level, right? Communism, it's the same thing, you know, the worker's paradise. If we could just all, you know, work together, pull together, not compete with each other. But, and all of it is bullshit, right? I mean, nothing, nothing works. There's no upper level that you're going to get to in any of these things. And I think that the Greeks knew that, you know? And they weren't even, you know, that's why their gods were so human, right? The gods committed infidelities. They cheated. They lied. They, you know, screwed around on their partners and everything. And they were angry. They were crazy. And, uh, you know, I, I, I somehow I love that, you know. And when sometimes I get, you know, uh, because my books are about Greece, a lot of them, I get a lot of letters from Greece, you know, from real Greeks today. And they'll say to me, our country's in the toilet. You know, what can we do to, you know, how can we get out of it? And my answer is always, forget Christianity. Go back to the Olympian gods. That was when you guys had it together. And uh, so I don't know. I don't think they're going to do it. You know, you know they're going to do it. Well, so you mentioned um, like Sparta and Athens, how you, you so they're sort of a, a microcosm of 
humanity. And one of the, I've been thinking about this a lot lately since I read the tides of war, right? About the, the civil war between Athens and Sparta. And there's this great scene where the general of the Spartans, like Kyrgyz, gets up and gives this rousing speech about the difference between the Spartans and the Athenians. And he says, the Spartans have Andrea, and the Athenians have, I guess it's pronounced Thracides or Thracides? Thracides, yeah. Thracides. Okay, look at me. I'm not... Yeah. Can't. So wh- Who what knows? The, if we I, had a real Greek here, we'd probably, we'd probably pronounce it. So what, what are the differences between those two virtues, and which one do you resonate with personally? Ah, okay. And it, actually, it was Lysander. Clover Lysander, Clover. okay, excuse me. But I got to tell you, it's a great pleasure to, to be talking to somebody who's actually read my books and knows what the heck they are. But uh, Lysander, the Spartan admiral, who was really kind of a bad guy in a lot of ways, a true character, was comparing Athens and Sparta. And he said that, that uh, Sparta, and this is all fiction, but, I, but I'm sure it's true, um, Spartans are brave but Athenians are bold. And he makes a big, that's what Thrasytus and Andrea are. And, and he makes a, um, a real distinction between the two. And the, and the, the brave, this kind of plugs into the art of man. Yeah, exactly. In that's... Way, is the brave man, this is the Spartan, is in, in Lysander's view, pious, humble, modest, long-suffering. He's the kind of like an infantryman that can be on the front lines at 30 below zero, you know, with artillery rounds coming in every day, every, and just bears it, you know? And, and the brave man, according to Lysander, um, fears the gods, respects heaven, res- r- r- acknowledges that the human being lives on a lower level than the gods. And, and so is a, uh, has a certain becoming modesty to him. Now, the bold person, on the other hand, and he, Lysander, characterizes Athens as this, and I would say that I would characterize America in the same way, that uh, they're, not, they're not brave as much as they are, um, they're just willing to go balls to the wall on something. They come up with an idea, an outrageous idea, you know, ambitious tremendous stunt like, you know, invading a country that never did anything to us. And and they pull it off. And boldness has a, has a tremendous... Um, Alexander was really both of these. He was brave and bold. But boldness kind of carries the, the, the momentum of the enterprise, can sometimes carry something through, even when it's not very well thought out, you know, like going to the moon or something like that. And so what Lysander was saying, and Lysander was putting this down. He was saying boldness is not going to last. Boldness, he says, the, um, the man thinks of himself as God and kind of tries to, to, uh, to emulate the gods or to compete with the gods, to, to, to have really, really ambitious stunts. And uh, Lysander's point was the gods don't like that, and they're going to bring these people down. So that's anyway, that was a uh, thank you for coming up with that. You're the only person that's ever noticed that yet. Well, I just I mean, it, it was such a great scene. And the reason I resonate with because as I was reading that, I, it was um, I kept on thinking back to I was thinking, well, this sounds like Athens sounds like America today and kind of the values that we emphasize as a culture. Yeah. And, it is, yeah. and it's funny because like you read, you know, the founding fathers and while they admired Athens for their science and art they really admired the Spartan civic virtue. And I, I think that Andrea, or whatever, Andrea, which means manliness, um, the way you describe it, it kind of exemplifies that civic virtue of the Spartans. It's, it's long suffering. You're in it for the, you're playing the long game. Um, yeah. I mean, it's very well put. Yeah. Something I, I feel like I could use some more of in my own life, possibly. And I think we could use some in our own culture. But here's a question. So I guess for you as a writer, um, you were talking earlier about. Um, you know, the, the virtues of war and the virtues of warriorhood um, helps you in your writing. So I guess you would say Andrea, is that how you pronounce it? And, yeah, uh, I think. Andrea, yeah. is that the one that really resonates with you and gets you through your writing? That's, that's another great question. I think for, for any artist, I think you need both. You need the boldness to uh, come up with, a, with an idea that's 
really ambitious. You know, if you're going to write Moby Dick or Remembrance of Things Past or any anything, if you're going to do Avatar, you know, not that that's <laughs> great, but you know what I mean. It takes you got to have you got to be crazy enough to really go for it and really uh, um, extend beyond your capacity. But at the same time, any kind of long term work of art, like a novel or a, or a movie. You're in the trenches day after day after day with the rain beating down on your head. And so you need Andrea there, and you do need a, a respect for the gods, for the muse, you know, that to, to, to not think that you're the one that's doing it. So I think you need both. And that's why I think Alexander the Great was such a, why he was able to conquer the world. He was both. He had balls of steel, and, and, uh, but he also was capable of the long game. You know, he played, he, you know, he played it out for as long as he was breathing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this kind of segues nicely into talking about your nonfiction books. So you've written several nonfiction books that are very popular amongst writers, creative types, entrepreneurs. Um, and one of the books I just finished reading is uh, called Turning Pro. And you talk about in, the, in Turning Pro the difference between an amateur and a pro. Uh, can you talk about the difference between an amateur and pro? And here's a kind of segue back into Andrea and Thrysties. Um, which one, you know, if you're a pro, which virtue do you have? And if you're an amateur, which virtue do you have? Um, that's another great question, Brad. I don't think it falls. I don't think that falls into that split like no. that. I think okay. if you're a pro, I think you need both. Gotcha. And if you're an amateur, you don't have either one of them. <laughs> um, um, you know, the difference to me, you know, there are many people who struggle to be, they have great they want to write a novel or they want to do something in the arts or some, you know, some long-term project and they can never quite get it together. And I was that way for years and years and years. I would start something, take it 99% of the way through and then crash. And to me, the, what, what the insight that sort of turned the corner for me was realizing that I was an amateur, that I was, uh, you know, when adversity hit, I didn't, have the guts to stick it out. You know, I didn't have the patience, all those warrior virtues, right? I suppose amateur to pro is the difference between non-warrior and warrior. But, uh, you know, a, a professional is somebody, if you think of a professional athlete that knows how to play hurt, that shows up every night, that, you know, when, when there's no glamour involved in it, is still there doing the work, you know, putting, you know, doing the shoot around, putting up the shots, taking care of, uh, turning pro, the book is about, the moment of changing from an amateur into a pro, even if it's only in your own mind, you know, forgetting about the money aspect of it. Yeah. And you talk about through all these books and turning pro and in your other works that the thing that keeps people from turning pro is what you call resistance with a capital R. Um, can you explain, I'm sure you've answered this question lots of times on these types of podcasts, but what is resistance? <laughs> uh, well, resistance is, uh, to me, I experienced it. Right now, I'm sitting here at my desk, and here's my keyboard. Can you see that? Oh, yeah, I can see and, it. And uh, here's my, I'm looking right at my computer. When I get, when I come to sit down here, there's a force that's radiating off of this keyboard that says, don't do the work. <laughs> go have a hot fudge Sunday. go to the beach, you know, fuck off, you know? That's resistance. If you've ever bought a treadmill, as I say, in the War of Art and uh, brought it home and let it gather dusk in the attic, then that, you know, what resistance is. So you were saying before, Brett, about uh, how, why do I write stuff about war? Well, to me, the enemy is this force that I call resistance with a capital R. And it's inside ourselves. And it's the force, it's all the forces that will keep us from becoming our best self from getting our PhD, from starting that business, from, you know, creating, you know, the art of manliness or whatever it is, whatever enterprise we're, we're talking about, self-sabotage, procrastination, perfectionism, all of those things that we know about, laziness, greed, um, over-competitiveness, um, that's resistance. And um, it seems to be it must be born in everybody because I get hundreds and hundreds of letters, as you can imagine. Sure. And uh, so, again, the sort of the, 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 the manly virtues, sort of in my mind, although it could also be womanly. You know, sure. if you look at it from the point of view as a mother, who's braver than a mother raising a child? Yeah. Um, 
are the virtues, the internal virtues that allow you to face resistance and, and to overcome it and to do your work instead of letting resistance defeat you. And, you know, you blow your whole day, blow your year, blow, you know, blow your lifetime. So and what I find fascinating, too, about what you write about in Turning Pro and do the work, like, yeah, well, do the work. Like the your response basically to resistance is just get busy, like start doing something. Right. And then the magic happens. Like, I think a lot of people I know I've had this experience, too, personally, is like I expect the magic to happen. Right. I'll get, you know, the angels will come and you know, right. the muses will come to me and then I'll just start writing. But you say it's the other way around. You have to start. You got to work for that. Then the muses or that inspiration comes. Which is exactly true. It's a very workmanlike principle. There's a, that quote from Somerset Mom where somebody asked him, uh, do you write according to a schedule or only when inspiration strikes you? And he says, I write only when inspiration strikes me. He says, fortunately, it strikes me every morning at nine o'clock sharp. <laughs> so in other words, that's the concept of do the work. Um just, you know, it's like the Nike slogan, just do it. Just do it. Sit down. That's, to me, there's no mystery to it. You know, yeah. it's just a matter of, um, I have another saying that I say, which is put your ass where your heart wants to be. And what I mean by that is, if you want to paint, get your body in front of an easel. You know, if you want to be a filmmaker, get out and shoot film. You know, just act first and then inspiration will come in the course of it. Are there um, other things that get in the way of returning pro or becoming an amateur? Um, so for example, you mentioned, I think in the authentic swing about in the Bhagavad Gita, um, I think it was Krishna. Said, yeah. Um, said this, that, yeah. you know, you're entitled to your labor, but not the fruits of your labor or something like that. It's like focusing on the yeah. fruit, like on the reward. Is that just a form of resistance or is that something else that gets in the way of turning pro? It, it is a form of resistance, okay. and I got to say, Brett, it's a pleasure to be interviewed by you, who actually have, have thought about these things, and you know, you actually have done your you've done your work. I really appreciate well, it. Well, thank you. Uh, and I and I think it'll be very helpful to people who hear this interview that they'll actually, you know, you you can imagine the incredible bullshit questions I get from a <laughs> lot of people. But anyway, back to what was the question again? Well, so I mean, like, so like, is There's focusing on the yeah, focusing yeah. on? I think he said something about you know, you're entitled to your labor, but not the fruits of your labor. Right. So that is a real Eastern principle. It's a Hindu principle that uh, the concept of like we here in the states. If we're going to start some kind of project, we already ask ask ourselves, right? Well, what's the payoff? Yeah. Where's the money? Where are the women? Or what, what do I get out of this stuff, right? Whereas it's a much more Eastern concept to say that the work is its its own reward, and you're not looking for the big payoff, pie in the sky, brass ring at the end, but you're just trying to you have the right to to do your labor, but not to the fruits of your labor. And if you look at people that that crash and burn after success, it's, you can watch it again and again. They suddenly get the fruits of their labor and they just dive in and forget everything else. And then it's the fastest way to go straight down the tubes. So just, I guess the goal is to focus on the process, not the end result. Not the product. Yeah. yeah process, not, product. not pro Yeah. Process, not Which product. is really true. I mean, it sounds like a bunch of high flown stuff, but if, if you're, you know, when you're a kid and you go out and you're playing basketball on the court in your yard, you just love the game, right? Yeah. That's all. That's the pure, the pure sense of it, the pure reality of it. Here, here's a question. So, I, I mean, I personally resonate with this whole idea of fighting resistance and being a warrior in the face of that dark cloud that says you can't do it. But, I mean, do you always have to be fighting it or is there times when you can let go and just like relax a bit or do you always have to fight the resistance? Is that something you always have to do or do you need to know when to lay off a bit? I mean, I know it's kind of a vague question, but I was wondering about that. No, I, I, I know what you mean. Yeah, and actually. Um, I mean, I do certainly think that. Uh, another thing I always say is that habit is a mighty ally. Yeah. And once you're in the groove of doing anything, going to the gym, swimming, running, you know, but uh, I, I think you were asking a different question. Okay. And um, I'm actually sort of right now in that kind of state 
where I, I just have finished a three year project and I'm not, I'm kind of starting another one, but I'm, I'm, I'm not really into it yet. Mm -hmm. And it's a very dangerous place to be for, for any artist. Um, have you ever heard of, uh, Billy Bishop, the world war one, he was a world war one fighter pilot Mm -hmm. and he had some, some rules that he put out. And one of the rules that they still talk about among in any air force today is when is the most dangerous time for a fighter pilot? And it is, the answer is it's immediately after making a kill Mm -hmm. because you're suddenly right. You're all puffed up with yourself. You're so, and you lose, you take your eye off the ball and somebody is on your tail and they shoot you down. So, I think when you finish one project, resistance is is still there. It's hovering over you, and and you have to kind of, for me at least, get into another one right away and not get into that trough, that that dip that Seth Godin talks about. Yeah. Otherwise, it gets harder and harder. It's just like a fitness regime, right? If you finish running a marathon and you crap out for the next two months— when you try to start again, boy, it is really hard, you know? doesn't mean you can't rest for a little while after a marathon, but you got to get back on the horse pretty soon. Sure. I, I think that that principle by Billy Bishop, I think other generals from history understood that as well. I remember Alexander the Great and even Napoleon mentioned how like, after a victory, they would let their soldiers maybe celebrate a little bit, right? Get their, yeah, get yeah. their um their treasure and women. Um, but then right away they got them on another project, whether it was like digging a, a, a canal or whatever, because once, yeah, they knew once they got in that sort of lull, it was hard to get out of it again. Yeah. All right. Um, so here's a question I, I had from a, a reader. He wanted me to ask you is you know, he, he really resonates with um, your, your nonfiction about, you know, fighting resistance. And, and it seems like a lot of it's geared towards writers and creative types because you're a writer, but do you think it's just as applicable to say you're, you work in a corporate gig or you're an electrician or a student? Do you think those, uh, those principles are just as applicable? Well, that's another great question. I think that, uh, there's two different kinds of jobs in my opinion. There's a job that you do for money that your heart isn't really in, you know, yeah. Um, and there, I don't think resistance enters at all. You just slogging the work, doing your thing. But, yeah. but when it's a job that you love, and a lot of times it's it that's your side job. You know, somebody will work as an electrician, but they'll build motorcycles in the you know in the garage on the weekend, and that's their kind of love. That's their passion, and that's where resistance will come. In my opinion, in my experience, resistance shows up when you're trying to move from a lower level to a higher level, when you're trying to do something that you really love, that really is coming from the best part of yourself. Um, otherwise, if you're just going to work, you're riding the subway into some cubicle, it doesn't even enter the picture. Well, very interesting. Well, Stephen Pressfield, thank you so much for your time. This has been a, just a fascinating conversation. Uh, I've really enjoyed your insights. I've gotten some insights that I've had questions about that, whole Lysander speech I've been thinking about a lot lately. So it was great <laughs> hearing uh, hearing your input on that. So thank you so much again for your time. Hey, Brett, thanks to you. Thanks for the great questions. And thanks for what you've done with the art of manliness. You know, my hat's off to you. I salute you. Well, this is, that's a great work of art that you started from nothing and that you produced out of your own heart and your own passion, you know, that is helping a lot of people. Well, thank you very much. That means a lot coming from you. All right. Till All right. next time. Till next time. Do the work, right? our guest today was Stephen Pressfield Stephen is the author of several books ranging from fiction to nonfiction. his latest nonfiction book is The Authentic Swing it's about his experience writing The Legend of Bagger Vance and lessons you can take from that Uh, also lessons from the game of golf a really great book and you find that on Amazon.com his latest fiction book is The Profession Uh, if you read Gates of Fire Tides of War and you enjoyed those books you'll love The Profession it's all about that warrior ethos but set in the near future and you can also check out Stephen Stephenpressfield.com. Stephen and his crew are constantly putting out top quality content there. Uh, if you are a, an aspiring writer, especially, you'll find the information there uh, extremely useful. And even if you're just a, a entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, you'll find the content there uh, motivating and, and useful as well. So make sure to check out stephenpressfield.com. 
Well, that wraps up another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. For more manly tips and advice, make sure to check out the Art of Manliness website at artofmanliness.com. And until next time, stay manly. Thank you.